Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Peter Harrington. Thank you all for coming to this private preview of Lord Byron's copy of Frankenstein, presented to him by Mary Shelley. My name's Adam Douglas, and I'm the firm specialist in early books. I've been a bookseller for nearly 25 years now, and I've been privileged to handle a number of exciting books, but I can honestly say that this copy of Frankenstein is the single most thrilling item that's ever passed across my desk. One reason for that thrill is that I never suspected that the book had survived. None of us had any inkling where this book has been hiding for the last 200 years. You'd probably like to hear a little more about the discovery of this volume, so allow me to introduce the book's discoverer, Sammy J. Um, last November was a deeply unemployed midwinter for me, and I'd finished studying English at Oxford over a year before, and had little to show for it other than an enduring affection for my romantic poets, which didn't seem to be doing me all that much worldly good anyway. My step-grandmother, Mary, had kindly given me an occupation in sorting through my late grandfather, Douglas Jay's papers uh, for the Bodleian Archives. He was president of the Board of Trade uh, in Harold Wilson's government, among other things, but I'd hardly really known my grandfather, and it seemed an intriguing way to find out more about the man. I was not prepared, however, for the little volume lying at an angle at a corner on the top shelf, and indeed I almost passed over the spineless little thing. Luckily I didn't. To Lord Byron from the author. It took Mary and I a while to adjust to the magnitude of the find, and we did perhaps get a little bit too theatrical when we took, when we took the book to be held in the Bodleian vaults, carrying it through the streets of Oxford in the only secure briefcase we had to hand, Douglas's ministerial red box. <laughs> After that, the sequence of events leading up to this moment were mostly out of my hands. Richard Ovenden, the deputy librarian of the Bodleian Library, who sadly can't be here tonight, verified the inscription as being in Mary Shelley's hand. For future reference, the improbably loopy T, as you'll see over there, is a dead giveaway. And now, here it is. And here I am, and here we are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. By Mary's own account, the original idea to write their own ghost stories which produced Frankenstein was Lord Byron's. To explore the fascinating relationship between Mary Shelley and Lord Byron, we're honoured to welcome tonight Miranda Seymour. Miranda is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and in recent years a visiting Professor of English Studies at the Nottingham Trent University. She's also a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Miranda's definitive biography of Mary Shelley, first published in 2000, gives a fresh perspective on the author of the best-known and most original fiction of the Romantic era. Ladies and gentlemen, Miranda Seymour. When Byron died aged 36 in 1824, Mary Shelley, a young widow of 27, was living in a house in, Sm in North London. All the memories of the time they had spent together in 1816, living on the side of Lake Geneva, cheek by jowl, flooded back into her mind when she read of his death. Back in 1818, the year in which Frankenstein was published and which the Shelley clan moved into permanent exile abroad, as Byron had done before them, Mary found herself reading stanzas from Child Harold and remembering the lakeside life at Geneva that Byron had drawn upon for his fourth and most celebrated canto. This is Mary. Dear Lake, I shall ever love thee, she wrote in her private journal. How a powerful mind like his can sanctify past scenes and recollections. His is a powerful mind, one that fills me with melancholy, yet mixed with pleasure, as is always the case when intellectual energy is displayed. I think now of our excursions on the lake how we saw him when he came down, or welcomed our arrival with a good-humoured smile. How vividly does each verse of his poem recall some happy scene of this kind to my memory. Now, alone in London with her young son Percy, the only child of five to have survived, Mary looked back to the time when she had lived in close contact with not, with not merely one but two brilliant poets. Shelley had died in 1822, drowned in a boating accident. In 1824, Byron died at Missolonghi. 
His remains were brought back to England, including, presumably, the personally inscribed book which Sammy J discovered in his grandfather's library and which is now on display here for the first time. And I'm pretty fascinated by the fact that Byron actually had kept that little copy with him out in Missolonghi, because Byron did drop stuff along the way. He left things in Genoa, he left things in Pisa, but this he kept with him, and that says something about his feeling for Mary. The news of their friend Byron's death had devastated Mary. In this quotation from her journal, she refers to him as Albe, a pun on LB for Lord Byron, but also, I think, a neat anagram of Elba, the island to which Byron's hero, Napoleon, was exiled in 1814. This, then, was the coming event that cast its shadow over my last night's miserable thoughts, Mary wrote in London in 1824. Byron, too, has become one of the people of the grave, that miserable conclave to which the beings I love best belong. I knew him in the bright days of youth, when neither care nor fear had visited me, before death had made me feel my mortality, and when the earth was the scene of all my hopes. Can I ever forget our evening visits to Diodati, our excursions on the lake when he sang the Tyrolese hymn to freedom? and his voice was harmonized with the winds and the waves. Can I forget his attentions and consolations to me during my deepest misery? Never. Beauty sat on his countenance, and power beamed from his eye. His faults being, for the most part, weakness, induced one readily to pardon them. Albe, the dear, capricious, fascinating Albe, has left this desert world. God grant I too may die young. And that region now adds that resplendent spirit whom I loved. But then Mary grew anxious that her private words might be misinterpreted. Byron, after all, had had an affair with Mary's stepsister, resulting in the birth of a child, Allegra. At Geneva, the English colony across the lake had cheerfully assumed that Byron was having affairs with both the young women who, as they observed through their new hotel telescope, were keeping him daily company. So, Mary crossed out those last words, whom I loved, and instead she wrote, quite significantly still, that resplendent spirit whose departure leaves the dull earth dark as midnight. She might as well have said whom I loved, really, comes to the same. The relationship of Byron, Mary and Shelley is a deeply fascinating one and there's no time for it in this short address. All I can do is remind us that Shelley and Mary got to know the already famous Byron in London in 1815 when he was living apart from his wife and when he had had his one night stand with Claire, Mary's pushy stepsister. Urged on by Claire, Shelley and Mary followed him to Geneva, the lake by which, very famously, while reading spooky stories to each other, the idea came up, from Byron, of writing their own scary tales. So far, so good. But the question of exa exactly when Mary did start to write Frankenstein remains a vexed one. All we know is that it had been begun, she'd begun on it, by the time that she and Shelley and the now pregnant Claire returned to England in September leaving Byron to go on to Italy. On the 28th of April, 1818, Shelley sent Byron a copy of Frankenstein, published anonymously and with no reference to Byron himself in the introduction, which had been written by Shelley himself. And I'm pointing because this is that very copy. It is in fact Mrs. Shelley's work, Shelley told Byron in his accompanying note. He added that, Although the book had met with considerable success in England, Mary bids me say she would regard your approbation as a more flattering testimony of its merit. Well, Byron sent no direct reply, but writing to John Murray, his publisher, the following year, he corrected the assumption of a reviewer who had mistaken Frankenstein, as many did since the author was anonymous, for the work of Mary's husband. Pointing out that the novel was Mary's work, Byron added his own endorsement. Methinks it is a wonderful work for a girl of 19, not even 19 at that time. Mary had impressed him, and he her, from the first time that they met. He admired her as the daughter of William Godwin, as a brilliant novelist, as a girl who was uncommonly cool under pressure, and in the circumstance of an extremely difficult marriage. Byron liked Shelley, 
whom he nicknamed Shiloh, nicknamed Shiloh, but he respected Mary, to whom he would never have dreamed of giving a nickname. After Shelley's death, he helped the young widow out with money and with commissions of work as a transcriber, and after her death, he came to her aid once again. In 1831, a second edition of Frankenstein was issued. Mary had made almost nothing out of the first publication. This time around, desperate for money to support her son's life as a young gentleman of means, Mary wrote that astonishing preface which has become fixed in all our minds and which, from which Serena is going to read to us. In the summer of 1816, we visited Switzerland and became the neighbours of Lord Byron. At first, we spent our pleasant hours on the lake, all wandering its shores, and Lord Byron, who was writing the third canto of Child Harold, was the only one amongst us who put his thoughts on paper. These, as he brought them successively to us, clothed all in the light and harmony of poetry, seemed to stamp as divine the glories of heaven and earth, whose influences we partook with them. But it proved a wet, ungenial summer and incessant rain often confined us for days to the house. Some volumes of ghost stories, translated from German into French, fell into our hands. I've not seen these stories since then, but their incidents are as fresh in my mind as if I read them yesterday. We will each write a ghost story, said Lord Byron, and his proposition was acceded to. There were four of us. The noble author began a tale, a fragment of which he printed at the end of his poem of Mazeppa. Shelley, more apt to embody ideas and sentiments in the radiance of brilliant imagery, commenced one founded on the experiences of his early life. Poor Polidori had some terrible idea about a skull-headed lady. The illustrious poets, annoyed by the platitude of prose, speedily relinquished their uncongenial task. I busied myself to think of a story, a story to rival those which had excited us to the task, one which would speak to the mysterious fears of our nature and awaken thrilling horror, one to make the reader dread to look round, to curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. If I didn't accomplish these things, my ghost story would be unworthy of its name. I thought and I pondered, vainly. I felt that blank incapacity of invention which is the greatest misery of authorship when dull nothing replies to our anxious invocations. Have you thought of a story? I was asked each morning. And each morning I was forced to reply with a mortifying negative. Many and long were the conversations between Lord Byron and Shelley, to which I was a devout but nearly silent listener. During one of these, various philosophical doctrines were discussed, and amongst others, the nature of the principle of life, and whether there was any probability of its ever being discovered and communicated. Perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism had given token of such things. Perhaps the component parts of a creature might be manufactured, brought together, and endued with vital warmth. Night waned upon this talk, and even the witching hour had gone by before we retired to rest. When I placed my head upon the pillow, I did not sleep, nor could I be said to think. My imagination, unbidden, possessed and guided me, gifting the successive images that rose in my mind with a vividness far beyond the usual bounds of reverie. I saw, with my eyes shut but with acute mental vision, I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine show signs of life and stir with uneasy, half-vital motion. Frightful it must be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavour to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. 
His success would terrify the artist. He would rush away from his odious handiwork, horror-stricken. He would hope that, left to itself, the slight spark of life which he'd communicate would fade, and that this thing, which had received such imperfect animation, would subside into dead matter, and he might sleep in the belief that the silence of the grave would quench forever the transient existence of the hideous cork which he'd had looked upon as a cradle of life. He sleeps, but he is wakened. He opens his eyes. Behold, the horrible thing stands at his bedside, opening his curtains and looking on him with yellowy, watery, but speculative eyes. <gasps> oh, I open mine in terror. The idea so possessed my mind that a thrill of fear ran through me. I could not so easily get rid of my hideous phantom. Still, it haunted me. I must try and think of something else. I recurred to my ghost story, <laughs> my tiresome, unlucky ghost story. Oh, if I could only contrive one which would frighten my reader as I myself had been frightened that night. Swift as light and as cheering was the idea that broke upon me. I found it. What terrified me will terrify others. And I need only describe the spectre which had haunted my midnight pillow. On the morrow, I announced that I had found my story. So into this preface, but never before, came the account of Shelley and Byron conducting long conversations about the principle of life and the animation of a corpse. But in fact, looking at the original sources, it seems just as likely that Shelley held these conversations with Byron's clever young doctor, Polidori, but that would not have helped sales. Polidori and Byron and Shelley were all safely dead. So Byron, perhaps truly, perhaps a little inventively, moved into the foreground. Dreams by 1831 had also become immensely popular. So Mary, in 1831, suddenly recalled for the first time how, very like the coming to Coleridge of Kubla Khan, she had been blessed by a dream in which, after days of mortifying failure to come up with an idea for a story, she suddenly saw the scene she was to create. Memorably, she set down that terrible vision of the creature rising to stand over its terrified creator. Behold, the horrid thing stands at his bedside. That extraordinary scene appears not in the novel, as we all tend to think, but as the source of her inspiration. I have found it, she remembered herself thinking in the preface. What terrified me will terrify others. And on the morrow, I announce to them all that I have thought of a story. Thank you. And our thanks to Miranda, thank you Serena, and also to Sammy who found the book. And thank you very much and please enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>